we'll get started in just a minute here, as soon as everyone gets in. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, our end of March uh, leadership session here for Hasbara. Uh, it's great to uh, to have everyone with us, and uh, we uh, we've been doing these leadership sessions uh, once a month uh, here for the last uh, last year and a half or so since they were since they were born. And um, great great opportunity for continuing education. It's a great opportunity to have our our entire community together, our our students, our alumni. Uh, and of course, our, our donor network who, who makes our work on campus possible. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Of course, as, as you know, you know Hasbara, our, uh, our focus is, uh, is training Jewish and pro-Israel student leaders uh, to, be, to be the leaders and the best activists as they can be on their college campuses. And, and you, everyone uh, you know, knows us for our missions to Israel and uh, training students through that special Israel experience that, that you only get on Hasbara, uh, but, uh, but engaging and learning and, and getting together virtually uh, is an important, an important uh, part of our mission too and something we, we need to be taking advantage of and, and co constantly uh, continuing our education. Uh, and, and that's exactly what we're, we're gonna be doing here today. And, uh, and I really, you know, we couldn't think of a more a uh, timely topic uh, than, than the one that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and we have Gil Hoffman uh, with us, which Gil, thank you for joining us. And, and those of you who are uh, Hasbara veterans like me have heard Gil speak at least two dozen times for, for me. And uh, over the years, you know, Gil's spoken to, I think, every Hasbara group, uh, at least in the last decade or so, um, and, and we're, which we're, we're honored. Uh, that he takes the time to, to talk to us and take the time to speak to, to students. He's actually uh, on a speaking tour where he's uh, doing a lot of campuses at the moment. So normally we speak to you from Jerusalem. At the moment, you're in Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Louisville right now. And you'll be in 10 states uh, here visiting campuses and communities. And so he'll thank you for, for, for joining us. And you know, normally you're our go-to on, on Israeli politics. You're, you're chief political correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. You meet us at the Knesset. You tell us what's going on there. Um, today, we're, we're going to ask you about a different topic, and, and the topic is, is Ukraine. Uh, you were just there on the border for about a week, if I'm not mistaken. You could correct me if I'm wrong. And, um, and it's an important topic, and, and we'll, be, we'll be getting into it here in a minute. But, you know, of course, it's an important topic for the world. It's also a topic that uh, we've all, everyone on this call has, has read about plenty. Uh, but it, it is apropos and, and sort of very much uh, an important uh, kind of angle here that we're going to we're going to take uh, to to think about kind of what it means, what it means for Israel, what Israel's involvement has been. And, and for us as campus activists, uh, we're already hearing uh, some some signaling and some messaging uh, on campus trying to to use the Ukraine crisis to to delegitimize Israel and and intimidate Jewish students. We're already hearing things like, uh, you know, Putin is being boycotted, Israel should be boycotted too. We're hearing uh, for uh, equating of the victims uh, in Ukraine to Palestinian victims. We're already hearing that on campus. And so we'll, we'll want to explore a little bit about that with you, Gil. And, uh, and so with that, Gil, welcome and, and welcome everyone for uh, that, that's joining us. Thanks. Pleasure being here. Thank you, Gil. And, and I, I usually have questions uh, ready, you know, ready to go for these these sessions. But um, in this case, uh, you know, you were just in Ukraine. Uh, question number one is, tell us everything. I mean, what was it? What was it like? Uh, on, you know, there on the front lines? And what did you see? And um, what, what should we know that we may have not seen in, in the headlines? Thank you so much, Ellie. I, I went on a personal journey. You know, I, I did not want to go there. I did not think I would go there. When I was offered to go there, I was going to say no. I mean, I have a pretty cushy job covering politics in the Knesset. You know, I, I have my office in the Knesset, my seat that, uh, with my name on it that overlooks the plenum and my gym paid for by the taxpayers. 
and when I was offered to go, I, I just thought, I love my kids too much. I don't want to go to a war zone. It's not me. Um, hope I'm loud enough here. Um, and I decided, you know, I'm, leave my comfort zone and I will uh, see what's going on. But I said, I'm not going to go for Shabbat. That would be too hard. I've made it on the loudest if anyone still has a problem. Um, and I'm really glad that I did. I went through four countries to get to the border with Ukraine and Moldova. And I must have gone also through a time warp to a world that I never thought I'd see. To the world where my grandparents lived who were Holocaust survivors. I found out later that my own great grandparents were murdered by Ukrainians. My grandfather always told me that the Ukrainians were worse than the Nazis to him. And, and I got there to the border and I saw a steady stream of people crossing that line, uh, mostly women with little girls, with little pink backpacks, um, who told me that they had been walking for hours in order to get there. They left behind their home, their husband, their father to fight in the war, not knowing if they'd ever see him again, if they'd ever get their home back, if they'd ever come back at all. Um, I was brought there by the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews who uh, then showed us the efforts that they were making, uh, the places where they were housing refugees temporarily there in Moldova before they moved to Israel. And uh, it was there at, their, at the campsite that I met a woman named, Ale, named Anna Galanskaya, who's 89 years old, who told me that when she was nine years old, she joined her father in a horse-drawn wagon driving east as far as they could uh, to get away from the Nazis into the Russian Ural Mountains. And that back then she never thought that she'd one day have to then flee in the other direction, running away from the Russians. And then Shabbat came and I didn't leave. And I saw what was going on in the synagogue right around the corner from my hotel. Constantly buses arriving full of people there were mattresses on the floor. There were tents all over on the outside of the synagogue uh, where the refugees were being helped. The Orthodox, very Orthodox rabbi was constantly on his phone helping people. He drove back on Friday night back to the border. He cooked for the people. He brought back on Shabbat. Pikuach Nefesh, saving lives is what came first. And I saw it. And then I went to the Chabad after that. And I saw all the big rabbis of Chabad of Ukraine who came there to Kishinev for Shabbat after helping everybody leave Ukraine in their community. They locked the door, they took the Torah scrolls and they came. And uh, then the, after the service, they danced. And I was really annoyed because it was freezing cold there at the Kiddush and what little food we were going to be given at all. And I asked them, why are you dancing? And I heard what they were singing. They were singing Vesamachta Bechagecha, a song about being happy on a holiday. What holiday is it? And one of the rabbis told me, it's like a kid who has a piece of candy that he desperately wants and his father won't let him have it. So he makes a blessing on the candy. So his father would give it to him because you can't say God's name not in, uh, in vain. Uh, they were trying to push God uh, in order to make it a holiday, to make it, to make there be joy after all they had been through. And they had all, one after another, said the Hagomel blessing for being saved at the synagogue there. I got the last Aliyah there, the last Aliyah in Exodus, and only realized later, I, I myself had gone through an Exodus. Uh, I'm never going to complain anymore about it being too cold or, or being too hungry. Um, my life changed forever, so I'm really glad that, that I went uh, put it all into proportion, which covering politics with all the nitpicking they do, I, I think I needed that. Wow, well, that's, um, that, that's powerful. I, um, I don't, you know, so much more I want to know here, and I'm sure the audience will have, will have questions too, but um, I mean, Give us, and we've we've seen accounts in, in in the paper and you know different different newspapers from different places along the border. But I mean, how many people were were there at the synagogue? How, how give, give us an idea of of the of kind of how many people were around? Did you feel? Could you tell that there's sort of was, in that moment that there's 
the masses are coming your way? I mean, sure. It was just constantly packed for, you know, Friday it was constantly packed and then there were different people there in Shabbat morning uh, packing this little place. And, and then we came back uh, on the way back from Chabad there, where I went later, there were constant people coming. Um, uh, when we went there a different day, it was full of different people. Israel itself, if you want exact numbers, uh, there are already 20,000 Ukrainians that have entered Israel in the wars in the months since the war began. That's not counting the Russians. Russians are coming too. It's easier for the Russians to come because the men are allowed to leave for now. Mm. Um, and so those 20,000 include 10,000 that came on the basis of the law of return, which you know mm. defines a Jew as one Jewish grandparent like Hitler. 80% of those people aren't Jewish. Um, and then there were 5,000 who are interior minister Yelichik had let in without any Jewish connection. And then there's another 5,000 who came in because they have a relative who's already a citizen of the country, meaning they, they're related mm -hmm. to someone who has a Jewish grandparent. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and is that, and tell us, a, what do you know about the, is that number growing still? Are we expecting uh, a, a larger, larger number now? I know there's been some debate in Israel about what law the, 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 what role the law of return should play um, and, and whether people should, uh, you know, there should be any cap on, on allowing them in. What, what's the status with that discussion to the best of your knowledge? They're letting in 5,000 a week, mm. um, you know, which makes sense, 20,000 in four weeks. Um, and it's gonna keep on going. It's, uh, the Russians realize what they've gotten into also. Uh, so the, the Russian Aliyah is twice as much potential, twice as many Jews in Russia as Ukraine. Right. And, you know, Israel, you know, obviously has been on, on the front lines here and, and um, you know, in a way you could say it's not, it's not new. I mean, we see Israel in Haiti, we see Israel, Israelis flying around for earthquake in Mexico City. I mean, name a natural disaster and you have Israeli teams there kind of leading the way. Um, and no, no, no exception here. Um, and it's a, a little ironic that we see uh, Gigi Hadid, uh, the world famous uh, supermodel, say, "I'm going to be uh, donating my my revenue this month to victims in Ukraine and Palestine." Um, tell us a little bit about just how do we combat that on campus? You know, we 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 hear that, and we're expecting uh, we're expecting that message to be echoed you know, by the BDS movement on campuses, and we've got to uh, be ready for it. You know, we need to reclaim our victimhood. We are not white people. Uh, we are we are, we are our minority that's been the minority targeted more than any other minority in the history of mankind. And uh, we have been invaded and attacked Israel more than any other country. Um, we are faced with terrorism constantly. It's happened in a terrible way today and over the past week to the point that I've had to change my talk from peace politics Putin and the pandemic to peace politics, Piguim, Putin and the pandemic, uh, terrorist attacks um, in Hebrew. And um, it's interesting that Ukraine, it, they're not learning from Palestinians. They're learning from us. Mm -hmm. The mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, who I interviewed, boxing champion, you wouldn't want to fight him. Uh, he uh, said uh, that he wants to learn from Israelis how to keep everyone involved in it, realizing that they're fighting for their home. So it, we, if, if we're in this analogy, uh, we're the victims. We're just like Ukraine and uh, just like uh, Russia. Are, they're good people. Um, they, uh, the Russian people, it's uh, their evil dictatorship uh, that controls them. It's harming their lives. The same things for the for the Palestinians. I wish they had better leadership that was devoted to helping the Palestinian people. We're we're not against the Palestinian people. Um, we you know uh, our week on campus is called Peace Week, right? Um, they deserve better, and, and it's their leadership that's let them down, not us. Right. Um, you know, one thing we kind of. Um, you know, it's kind of see see a lot in in the media and in, in discussions 
in general on campuses today is, is this idea, idea of hijacking somebody else's narrative. You know, and um, I can't think of a more egregious example than trying to hijack the Ukrainians narrative now for the goals of, of the students for justice in Palestine and, and uh, other supporters of, of boycotting Israel. Um, which Look, I, 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 when I was in Georgia on the Georgia Tech campus, they were having this meeting to prepare for their Israel Fest yesterday. And uh, I, they, had, they said they want to have some kind of Ukraine connection. Everybody does, I understand. Um, uh, so they, I showed, I told them, you know, you've got all these reports of the Israeli humanitarian efforts there, uh, of the uh, field hospital and everything. Show those uh, on a loop uh, at the festival, so people understand that that we're the ones helping. Um, it's absolutely wrong for people to steal a narrative, but if we're dealing with Ukraine itself, then uh, we need to show that. As you said, just like Haiti, just like everywhere else around the world, we are the first ones on the ground helping save lives. I want to change uh, the subject a little bit here, just to, to more Israel's geopolitical kind of standing here and, and what Prime Minister Bennett has kind of, uh, the way he's approached this situation with Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, certainly at the, the I mean, he made headlines by flying to, to, to Moscow and attempting to be the mediator and took a lot of criticism for it too, for, for not taking sides. Um, and uh, curious, what, what is, is that going to continue to be the, the approach here? It doesn't seem like there's, there's been a change. Um, and what lessons of any is Israel learned uh, from its initial reaction to, to the Russian invasion? So first of all, people are telling me that they can't hear me. Oh. Uh, I do have it on the loudest. I, I didn't realize that I have a problem. Um, I am volume is totally fine for me. Maybe your computer volume is low. Sure, I hope. I mean, I'm I'm perfectly happy to uh, try to get on another device. I've got another two around here, but um, I'll keep on talking and hope that people hear me you, well. I, I hear you okay, and uh, and the recording will be available as well. If anyone is having trouble with your computer. We'll, uh, we will send around the recording uh, after the talk as well. Um, I, I see okay. a few people confirming here that we can hear you fine. So um, those who- those So who there are two parts to Ali's question then. The, the first, uh, the, the second part of Ali's question was about the lessons learned and the first part was about uh, Bennett's strategy. And so the, the, the two lessons that I've gotten for Israel out of this are number one, that we have to be independent and not rely on the world as much as we have uh, probably better relations with the world than we've ever had before right now. Um, we need to be reliant only on ourselves and on God. Uh, that is an obvious lesson. But the, the other lesson is that everything people have been saying over the years recently that being strong is actually a weakness nowadays in the days of social media and only the underdog and, and getting support and everything. I don't know if it was ever true, but it's not true now. You need to be strong. Uh, being strong is not a liability. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that we're strong. Um, now, being strong has allowed us to feel comfortable being a mediator. Obviously, the Ukrainians are on the right side and we don't want to go on the wrong side. But um, we've had to take into account our own national security interests with Syria being controlled by Russia on our border. And, and why are the Russians in charge there? Because in 2012, when Obama threatened uh, Syria that if they use chemical weapons against their people, then America is gonna go in there, he broke his promise. And after he broke his promise, Russia saw that and they said, well, and we can get away with whatever you want. And they went in there, they invaded Syria and they're still there. And, and they invaded Crimea then in 2014 and now they've invaded Ukraine. Um, so having them there has made the Russians trust us because we work with them in uh, getting permission to attack Iranian and targets there and whenever we need to. Uh, so that's built up trust with the Russians. We have trust with the Ukrainians uh, and that's put in, us in a unique position to be able to end this war. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a million Russians and Ukrainians in our country that also makes us feel very close. And another thing, uh, Elliot, it's really great being Switzerland for a change. We're so used to being 
one side of the conflict. Yeah. This has definitely built up Israel internationally as, as a respected world leader. Right. And Gil, maybe you can spend a minute telling us a little bit more about, about the, the delicate uh, coordination going on between Israel and Russia in, in Syria. You know, it's not um, exactly uh, the, the Hasbara talking point. It's not front and center at the moment, but I think it is important for, for anyone who's a pro-Israel leader to, to really understand in depth um, that, uh, you know, Israel put it, t tell me if I'm not putting it quite correctly here, but Israel needs Russia's cooperation for, for security in, in the North. And, um, you know, anything to, that could throw off that, the balance there in that relationship could, uh, could lead to, to lives lost in, in Northern Israel. Is that correct? C correct. We have, we have a deconfliction mechanism uh, where we inform the Russians uh, whenever we need to hit an Iranian target in order to make sure that Russians' lives are not lost in that attack. That prevents war with Russia. And uh, that has helped uh, protect I Israelis because we need to prevent Iran from expanding its influence in Syria and in Lebanon. Um, but we also uh, have worked closely with Ukraine. There are ex-IDF officers who are training people in Ukraine. It's not an official Thing, but it's happening. Interesting. Um, Gil, moving on, and I'm, I'm, this will kind of be my last my last topic here, and then we'll open it up. But um, you know, I, I moving away from the politics a little bit, and just um, sort of looking at this from a Jewish Jewish angle here. You know, I um, you told us about the Chabad rabbis helping people, and 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 you know, we've read inspiring stories of people making it out of the war zone and. To safety across the border, and then, and then to to kind of their ultimate uh, their 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 last destination being Israel. And it's, um, stories are inspiring. And I I just want to read out the quote we heard uh, from Nathan Sharansky a couple of weeks ago. That uh, for anyone who hasn't heard it, I think was pretty powerful. And I'd love to get your reaction to it, Gil. But um, and I, I have it pulled up here. Um, and if you'll bear with me, I'll I'll read it. Uh, and try to shorten it a little, but um, when I was, so he says, when I was growing, this is Sh Nat Natan Sharansky, uh, former, uh, former chairman of the Jewish agency, former, uh, former minister in several Israeli governments and, and one of really the most famous Jew to come out of the Soviet Union after, after being a, a prisoner there. Um, and so he says, uh, when I was growing up in Ukraine, there were people from many nations and nationalities and some had ID papers that said, Russian, Ukrainian, Georgian, or Kozak. Uh, and these were not too important since there was not much difference between them. He says the single designation that stood out was Jew. If that was written on your papers, on your ID uh, in the Soviet Union, it was as if you had a disease. So he, he goes on, he says, we knew nothing about Judaism. There was nothing significant about our Jewish identity other than the anti-Semitism, the hatred and discriminatory treatment that we experienced because of it. When it came to a university application, for example, no one tried to change his designation from Russian to Ukrainian, because that didn't matter. However, if you could change your designation, to, uh, if you could change your ID to, if it said Jew, and if you could change it, it would substantially improve your chances uh, of getting into university. This week, I was reminded of those days when I saw thousands of people standing at the borders of Ukraine trying to escape. They're standing there day and night, and there's only one word that can help them get out. The word is Jew. If you're a Jew, there are Jews outside who care about you and are waiting for you. There's someone on the other side of the border who's searching for you. Your chances of leaving are excellent. The world has changed. When I was a Jew, when I was a child, Jew was an unfortunate designation. No one envied us. But today on the Ukrainian border, identifying as a Jew is a most fortunate circumstance. It describes those of us who have a place to go where their family and an entire nation is waiting for them on the other side. Okay. Well, I, I love Natan and it's mostly true <laughs> um, that, uh, by the way, he, he's also the one who's been highlighting, he highlighted in the Wall Street Journal, um, how uh, the moral issues that Israel is dealing with right now I mean, he disagrees with Israel mediating instead of being firmly on the side of Ukraine. 
but that it's the United States itself that, that needs to realize that it's at fault because of what they did in 2012 in Syria. Um, what's going on right now um, is that absolutely the Jewish people are helping uh, their Jewish brothers in Ukraine more than anybody else is. Uh, but where he's not entirely accurate is that there's also non-Jews helping non-Jews very beautifully. Um, I saw the people of Moldova just come up to the border and tell refugees, I'll take you anywhere you want in Europe, uh, come into my house. Ukrainians are free to work without papers anywhere in Moldova. Uh, I've seen uh, the way Poland and Germany have, have also behaved much nicer than they've done in the past to help people while we put up bureaucratic hurdles for reasons that are understandable being a Jewish state. Um, so the, the Jews aren't so perfect and uh, the Goyim aren't so bad. But I also saw the way that the Jews that the Jews are helping the Gentiles uh, with the Israel aid tent being right there, the first across the border, uh, full of toys and games and uh, diapers and baby food for women with uh, small children. And I saw the way that the non-Jews are helping the Jews because I, I was brought there by the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Everybody's helping everybody in a, a beautiful way. That's um, no, that is great to hear and. And um, I, I certainly accept that. And uh, but, but I, I, you know, I may just just I, of course, the world is a complicated place and, and it's not uh, that simple. But still, I, I um, have to say and, and you can react to this, Gil, if you want. If not, uh, we'll go to Q&A in a second. But um, but I, I, I do have to say, you know, from our perspective as as leaders on campus and um, you know, working on 80 plus campuses, I, I get the question all the time. Um, from staff, from alumni, from donors, from students, you know, that we're concerned that this next generation of, 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 of Jews and certainly American Jews, we, we get the concern all the time that they didn't know Holocaust survivors. They don't remember uh, things like the Six Day War. Uh, they, they now, college students don't remember uh, even the Second Intifada, right? And, and uh, it's sort of, there, there's this concern out there that is there, uh, uh, do we remember the reason uh, that we need a, a Jewish state and we need to fight for a Jewish state? And um, things like what we're seeing on the Ukrainian border and, and this quote from Sharansky, just remind us, uh, what is our why? You know, wh wh why do we do this? And um, while your point is well taken, I, I have to say, you know, I thought it was a powerful, powerful statement. Indeed it is. Especially for, for what we do and for, for, uh, things we think about every day so um thank you gil i um let me let's open it up to uh questions here from from the audience and if anyone has a question you can uh, raise your hand uh which you can do just by clicking on the chat and um i'm sorry clicking we click on uh where's the hand on zoom uh so someone could help me out do we have the question the hand raising enabled there Someone can uh, shoot me a quick message or put it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, press the reactions. The reaction. And then raise hands. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah. Thank you. Reactions on the bottom and, uh, and raise your hand if you have a question. You can also put it on the chat or uh, anyone who's streaming uh, on social media. You can send it to leadership at osborofellowships.org. Uh, so um, those are the ways to ask questions. And uh, I'll give everyone a, a minute to, uh, to raise your hand or get your questions in. In, in the meantime, uh, we will go to, uh, is Yessi ready with you? You ready with your question, Yessi? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Gil, so much for speaking. Uh, it's always a pleasure seeing you on our ISO program. Um, so my question was, how does the Ukraine-Russia conflict affect Israeli politics? And what does that conversation look like amongst members of the Knesset? I wrote an article for Friday's Jerusalem Post about how uh, Bennett is following the footsteps of uh, presidents of the United States, uh, and, and I believe this also happened in Canada as well, uh, of uh, looking more like a leader by engaging in global affairs. I believe that, that Stephen Harper did this when he was less popular in Canada and worked for a while. I wish it continued to work. Um, and uh, in uh, the United States, it, president after president, going back to Woodrow Wilson uh, and Teddy Roosevelt did this, uh, that uh, 
Bennett came in with a very little support politically in, in becoming prime minister. And this makes him look, uh, what they say in America, presidential. Um, and uh, his people thought that this will help him politically. Um, there was another poll today that found that only 9% of Israelis uh, say that he is fit to be prime minister, whereas uh, Netanyahu is still hovering in the 40s, 50s. So uh, I don't know if it's working, <laughs> but uh, that has been uh, the political impact. And uh, the way that the opposition has then responded to it is that instead of going on Shabbat to Moscow, um, that Bennett should have gone to Vienna to uh, have more influence on the Iran talks, and that would have been real pikuach nefesh of saving lives. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. And uh, for our, our next question, we have uh, Max. Max, you want to turn on your mic? And Hi, Gil. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us. We're always so lucky to hear from you virtually and also in person in Israel. Um, my question is, what can students do to help share and highlight Israel's different efforts? Highlight? I, what can I think you may have cut out. I think you may have cut out there, Max. If you want to try again, can you hear me? Okay. Now we can. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, wanted to know what student leaders can do to help share and highlight Israel's different efforts in Ukraine on college campuses. Okay. So I'm still thinking about it because uh, they, they asked me uh, yesterday. Um, at uh, Georgia Tech uh, about that. Uh, you handle the, the Southeast, is that your territory? Uh, yes, it is. And so uh, yeah, I told them to show the humanitarian efforts in the loop there. Um, that uh, is something that people need to know about. Um, I I'm worried about emphasizing too much because um, we, don't want people to say, well, you're not supporting Ukraine enough because you're mediating. And uh, I can understand that, that it would look bad that we're not supporting the obvious victim when we're supposed to be the light into the nations and the moral voice. Uh, but still, um, our efforts to save lives by mediating are, are important. Um, I think that whenever there are pro-Ukraine rallies on college campuses that the pro-Israel student groups should be there and uh, uh, vocal and uh, have it like be there with their Israeli flag and the Ukrainian flag together. Um, just like the woman had who won the Jerusalem Marathon on Friday. Uh, she was a Ukrainian refugee and there she is uh, in Jerusalem where, where she's uh, not planning on staying. She's there to uh, just for the course of, of the war her husband is behind in Ukraine. And I, I think that uh, putting out her statements there and her victory and everything, I think is also a very positive message. Um, those kinds of things. Thank you. I don't we have a question uh, from Pearl. Pearl, if you're ready to turn on your mic and uh, go ahead. And if everyone could introduce themselves, sorry, when you ask a question. Go ahead, tell us know, your name and, and where you are. Hi, um, I'm Pearl. I'm the Hasbro um, High School Advisor um, based in Canada. Um, and um, I'm wondering um, how, I guess if you could expand a little bit, you kind of just mentioned it, but how um, Israel can sort of navigate or how to kind of explain to people the complexities of um, whether it be students or just anyone that's asking kind of the complexities of Israel's position in kind of trying to be a mediator, but also recognizing the kind of moral issues at play. I don't know if there's a little bit more insight there. You know, with a high school kid, they need to think for themselves about different questions. Okay, first of all, what would they do if given uh, an hour to prepare or whatever, 15 minutes 
to prepare for taking whatever they can in a small backpack? What would they take to understand what it was like for, for refugees throughout history? And Jews have been refugees throughout history. And now Jews are again refugees uh, coming out of Ukraine. Uh, I think that's important. And what would they do if they are prime minister of Israel? And they, on the one hand, have an, a conflict with an obvious right and wrong, uh, where uh, Zelensky was absolutely right in saying you can't mediate between good and evil. Um, and on the other hand, saying, well, what if an Israeli pilot gets shot down by the Russians over Syria? Um, imagine the, what would that, that would do to the Israeli and, and Jewish worldwide psyche to have um, uh, a Jewish Israeli hostage. I think it's important to explain to diaspora kids because they have a different mentality than Israeli kids do. That in Israel, the soldiers are our boys. Um, in America, yeah, the so, uh, Canada, whatever, soldier, fine, okay. You know, they ask for it, they're a soldier. Uh, whereas a citizen, a, in a civilian, when a civilian gets hurt, that's a terrible tragedy. You know, in Israel, the terrorist attacks over the last few days, some of them have hit innocent civilians, mothers and fathers. And, and uh, the ones in the border police who were murdered, are, it's an equal tragedy for us. Because um, everybody, when they all send their children into harm's way, uh, one was an immigrant, uh, the, the one who died the other day. and. Um, so that's also, these are all moral dilemmas. And I think that uh, you have very smart students there uh, in Canada who, who can talk amongst themselves in panels or, or groups and whatever about different sides and what they would do when facing these moral dilemmas. Gil, you know, and thank you for that. And, and I, uh, you know, Max's question and Pearl's question um, so important and, and, you know, in a way they're, they're sort of, they piggybacked off each other and, and they kind of, you know, you're, I think we're, we're getting the question uh, kind of phrased differently, but, but similar question often, how do we communicate, you know, Israel's side of the story here? Um, and, and the reason we get it, the question often is because it's not easy. We know uh, pro-Israel students on campus, you've got to be able to break through the noise and, and um, it, it's, it's, Really, in this case, I think everyone was a little bit shocked that I think it was day four after the the, the Russian uh, invasion there that you got headlines with the Hadid, Gigi Hadid uh, uh, equating Russia to Israel to Russia and, and Ukraine to the Palestinians, and it's like you know we thought you know not not to minimize the the very uh, real real uh, concern for for Ukraine itself, but but it's still. Um, you know, as a Jewish student on campus, you say, pointing the finger at us again. And, um, and so... Ellie, Ellie don't give her too much about. credit. You know, uh, I, I think on campuses, they're going to understand this more because of this war. Mm -hmm. it, you know, Ukraine is under attack. Israel is constantly under attack. Uh, they're victims. Uh, we have suffered tremendously from terrorism. What happens to Israel is then employed to hit you, to harm Ukrainians. It's, it's uh, then employed in Colleyville and right by you, the way it was in the synagogue in Poway, mm -hmm. uh, evil has to be defeated around the world. And the Palestinians and the Muslim world have too many dictators who support terrorism and it can no longer be tolerated, not on campus and nowhere else. Powerful answer, powerful answer. Thank you, Bill. Um, oh, I, um, we, we have time for just uh, one or two more questions here, which um, I, if uh, we have one, and, and uh, not seeing a hand raised at the moment, um, who handles I think, your West Coast, Ellie? You I think I might. Here? Sorry, you have a West Coast person here? Uh, not at the moment. Not not not, not here. Uh, although we do, we have West Coast students. We might. Uh, I, I'm not. I don't have the gallery view on. But uh, but why do you ask, Gil? And then we're going to go to Pearl with a follow up question. I still have some free time next week on the West Coast. Uh, oh. you know, I just had a a talk added for tomorrow uh, when I'm in Maryland. Uh, I'm Israeli, I do things last minute. So uh, <laughs> Great. people can write me at uh, gilajpost.com if you happen to have a West Coast campus that can use an Israel slash Ukraine speaker next week. 
Amazing. And it's right here in my notes for when we close. I was going to repeat that. Bring Gil to speak on your campus. But I will repeat it in a minute. Let me take it to Pearl with the last question here. Um, Pearl, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I have another question if that's okay. Um, when the war started, there was a lot of um, kind of like really positive press for the Ukrainian president um, and people being like really proud. He's a Jew. He's like so amazing. And then I think when he spoke to the Israeli um, I think it was the Knesset. He sort of made certain um, Holocaust comparisons and things that people kind of got really upset about. And I'm just wondering how to kind of help, again, students or, or other people or even for ourselves to sort of process. I think right now we live in a very like cancel culture kind of society where like we go from loving people to hating people in a second and how to sort of look at the nuances and, and kind of see it as in the bigger picture. Um, obviously, he's not Ukraine. Like there's there's so many other people there. But um, just how to kind of frame that or process that. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, um, I think uh, someone once said, love makes you do crazy things, right? Uh, Will Smith on Sunday. And uh, so we, we, we love uh, the Jewish people uh, and, and uh, the Ukrainian president is one of us. Uh, but uh, he um, tried to use the the Jewish parent guilt thing uh, on Israelis. And I think that maybe works better with uh, North American Jews. Bring up the Holocaust, they'll, you know, all of a sudden they'll, they'll do anything for you and it pulls their heartstrings. Whereas in Israel, we really get defensive when people bring up the Holocaust because, you know, we're not in Israel because of the Holocaust, we're in Israel in spite of the Holocaust. And, and, and it's like taboo still, nobody can compare it to anything. Uh, how dare you try to take the mantle of our Holocaust and steal it? And uh, so that that's why it rubbed Israelis the wrong way, I think, more so than it does with, with uh, North American Jews. Uh, but um, absolutely, take advantage of the fact that he's Jewish. <laughs> Use that. Uh, he's the only other Jewish uh, prime minister in the world, uh, other than Naftali Bennett. Uh, Think about it. He, he's the only Jewish prime minister in the world who has the support of his people. Um, and uh, so he's a Jew in distress. We help Jews in distress. He's our brother. Thank you for that, Gil. And I, and we, we'll squeeze in one more question. I see Yair's hand up. Uh, Yair, if I you don't want know to, Yair. Yair, if you want to introduce yourself and uh, Hi, my ahead. name is Yair. I'm from uh, Toronto. Sorry, I don't have my camera. I'm using my phone. Um, yeah, just to follow up on Pearl's question, if she, she made a good point about the cancel culture and how the picture of uh, people and world leaders change uh, every day, but do you think it is good to kind of utilize the fact that he is Jewish and he is seen as a hero right now? But I mean, not just that he upset Israelis in, in his speech to the Knesset, but he, he has been lying and Spread, spreading a lot of propaganda, maybe for good causes, and doesn't change the fact that he is still the leader of the victim country. But one day that can turn up, and, and you know, uh, turn the, the tables can uh, can 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 change. And I don't know if it's strong enough as an argument to use the fact that he is Jewish to, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, considering Ukraine is not really supportive of Israel. So a lot of the progressives on college campuses can go ahead and say, well, he is Jewish, but he's the head of a, of a country that doesn't really vote in the UN or in support of Israel. So what do you think of that? Uh, yeah, I think you're smarter than the people you're talking to or you're more informed and uh, that uh, in the end, we have to dumb down and oversimplify uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, they're not checking UN voting, the UN voting record of Ukraine and they're not looking at who his wife is, and uh, they're um, in the end. Uh, Ukraine is under fire. A Jewish leader is under fire, and Israel's is under fire. And he wants Israel to end the war. He wants Israel to be the mediator. He has respect for Israel. He didn't want to talk in the parliament and in a lot of countries. He wanted to talk in our parliament. Um, and it doesn't matter that Jews help oh. that Ukrainians help the Nazis. Long time ago, do not bring that up. You know, uh, I had to 
when my aunt told me that Ukrainians killed my grand, great grandparents, okay, it was a long, long time ago. The world is a very, very different place. Japan also did a lot of terrible things, and nobody complains about them now. So um, uh, we have to talk to the students where they are, how they are right now, with the news as it is right now, and deal with this ball game that we're in right now. Thank you. you know, I appreciate that, and I, I um, and thank you for for answering that last question in the chat there too. Uh, from Murray. So uh, thank you. If anyone else wanted to ask a question, please feel free to uh, send it to us via email and we can get it, get it to Gil uh, if, he, if he has time. Uh, and uh, if not, uh, my promise is always, if I didn't get to your question, you're first in line uh, next month for, our, uh, for the next leadership session, uh, which will be happening on April 29th. Um, and uh, so that's, that's 7 p.m. Eastern uh, on Zoom. So after uh, after Pesach, excuse me, April 26th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and, uh, and so I hope everyone will be able to join us there. Uh, for those, uh, certainly students on the West Coast, Gil will still be, he has a couple more spots on his speaking tour. He's in Kentucky now, but next week he's at UCLA. He's in San Diego and uh, has a couple more spots for anyone in Southern California, right, Gil? Absolutely. Or Northern California, Southern California. Um, no, and, and if he's so not at your campus- southward. Sorry, Santa Barbara and Southward, not, not too much. Right, Santa Barbara and Southward. That's this time. Um, and if uh, he doesn't get to your campus this time, be in touch with your regional advisor, uh, and uh, we can figure out when the next time that is that Gill's coming, whether it's in the fall or a year from now next semester. But he he he's around, and he's one of the best speakers you can bring to your campus. Uh, so so be in touch. And uh, finally, any students uh, who, if you're with us and you've not been with Hasbara to Israel, it's time to sign up. Uh, we're almost full for May, May 15th, we're going to Israel. We're going again July 31st. Uh, sign up, the time to sign up is today um, and, uh, and applications will be open pretty soon for December as well. Hasbara fellows, those who've, who've been with us to Israel before, uh, please uh, tell your friends, tell your peers. If you're a Jewish leader on campus, if you're a pro-Israel leader on campus, uh, Hasbara is the way for you to get back to Israel and uh and apply asap um thank you gil thank you everyone i want to thank uh, our staff who's here i want to thank the students and i want to thank uh our supporters and donors who, who make our work possible it's great to have you and and it's a great time uh these sessions for you to to interact with the students so thank you all for joining us and uh gil if you have any closing words i'll let you uh take us home i just want to uh, say how much I love Hasbro fellowships. You know, I, I've been saying it to every campus that I'm speaking at uh, on this trip, um, uh, how the students have to be coming on, uh, on the Hasbro. Students tell me they've been on birthright and then they love Israel and they want to come back. And so th this is the way. And I, I send them to your website and I'm glad that you've got three trips coming up. And um, I've said that, that Israel's fighting three battles for its existence on the a military battlefield we had an advantage on their airwaves and social media i think it's pretty even but on college campuses we're at a great disadvantage and you guys are there in the trenches and training soldiers uh to be successful and that's why what you do is so important for israel's future so uh, thank you thank you very much gil thank you for for being a part of it and thank you everyone uh for being part of hasbara's efforts on campus until uh the next leadership session leadership session. We'll see everyone there uh, in April. Until then, uh, be well, be in touch, and uh, have a happy Pesach, everyone. Safe travels to you, Gil. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.